next, we've got Harold Schechter, who teaches at Queens College. He is a writer of historical true crime novels, the editor of the Library of America volume, True Crime, an American Anthology, and an Edgar nominee for his books, The Mad Sculptor and Curiosity House. Thank you. Um, very pleased to be here, uh, not only as a member of the Queens College English faculty, but as a proud alumnus of CCNY, uh, class of 1969. I know, that's totally terrifying. Um, I'm going to read a, a short passage from my book, The Devil's Gentleman, which is about a very sensational murder case that happened in turn of the 20th century New York City. And the book is also about the newspaper coverage of the case and uh, a phenomenon that has become all too familiar to us, uh, which is the blurring of the line between news and entertainment. When Joseph Pulitzer purchased the New York World in May 1883, a typical front page consisted of a half dozen columns of densely packed type, unrelieved by illustrations or eye-catching headlines. Viewed from a slight distance, the page resembled a solid block of gray print, so dreary in appearance that the layout ref was referred to as a tombstone. The content was equally numbing. On May 10th, 1883, its last day under the ownership of the financier Jay Gould, the world ran page one stories on the recent nominations submitted to the Board of Aldermans, the forthcoming dedication of the Brooklyn Bridge, and the election of the executive committee of the American Cocker Spaniel Club. Little wonder that the paper had a daily circulation of fewer than 12,000 copies and was losing $40,000 a year. All that changed the moment Joseph Pulitzer got hold of it. An immigrant, Pulitzer saw himself as a champion of the weak and oppressed. The world as he conceived it would be a paper, quote, dedicated to the cause of the people rather than to that of the purse potentates. In an early editorial, he laid out his goals, a 10-point program that included punishing corrupt office holders along with levying taxes on luxuries, inheritances, large incomes, monopolies, and privileged corporations. His method of achieving these lofty aims was to appeal to his readers' lowest instincts. After all, he reasoned, the best a publisher could do was, quote, go for a million circulation, and when you have got it, turn the minds and the votes of your readers one way or the other at critical moments. And the most effective way to reach the millions, that million circulation was by printing the kind of wildly sensationalistic stories that ordinary people have always gobbled up. He lost no time in putting his plan into action. The very first issue of the world, edited by Pulitzer, featured front page stories on a New Jersey fire that claimed the lives of a half dozen people the last hours of a convicted killer who had beaten his wife to death in a drunken rage, the public execution of another murderer, a hard case named McConkie, who went to his death cursing his jailers, a deadly lightning boat that killed a man on Long Island, and a dynamite attack by Haitian rebels that left 400 victims dead or wounded. The following days brought more of the same, headline stories about human sacrifices performed by religious fanatics, a little boy killed when his pony stumbled and fell on top of him, a smallpox scare in Hoboken, a killer tornado in Kansas, plus assorted homicides, suicides, hold-up speedings, and even a grave robbery. By the following March, a typical week brought such attention-grabbing headlines as child flayed alive, a man strangled by robbers, a lady gagged in a flat, and quintuple tragedy, an entire family annihilated by its head. The very look of the paper underwent a radical alteration. Headlines now stretched over several columns or were splashed across the entire top of the page. And there were cartoons, caricatures, lurid illustrations, and other voyeuristic visual aids. Not only were grisly murders reported in graphic detail, they were diagrammed so that readers could picture the horrors more clearly. Soon, Pulitzer had added a Sunday supplement, providing readers with such uplifting Sabbath fare as 
a long treatise on weapons used to commit murder in recent years, including a nail, a coffin lid, a red-hot horseshoe, an umbrella, a matchbox, a window brush, and a tea kettle. A thrilling narrative of cannibalism at sea and the supposedly true life tale of an English explorer thrown into a pit of vipers by fiendish African tribesmen. Pulitzer's sensationalistic strategy succeeded beyond all expectation. By March 1885, the world had a daily circulation of more than 150,000 copies, an astonishing tenfold increase in less than two years. That figure would double again before the end of the decade. The age of, the age of yellow journalism had arrived. <laughs>